The hush money trial of former President Donald Trump has opened in New York. Prosecutors laid out their case accusing Trump of election fraud by falsifying business records to cover up paying money to an adult film star. It's the first ever criminal trial of a former U.S. president. Donald Trump loves the spotlight, but maybe not this one. The former president arrived in court for the first day of a criminal trial, facing accusations of illegal election interference. The case hinges on whether hush money Trump's lawyer paid to porn star Stormy Daniels to cover up an alleged affair constitutes a crime. It's a case as to bookkeeping, which is a very minor thing in terms of the law, in terms of all the violent crime that's going on outside as we, as we speak, right outside as we speak. But this is a case where you've been a lawyer, as a lawyer, and they call it a legal expense. That's the exact term they use, legal expense, in the books. But the prosecution argued that those payments involved falsified documents. They allege it was part of a criminal scheme to influence the election by repressing damaging information about Trump. Part of that scheme is said to have involved former tabloid publisher David Pecker buying the rights to negative stories about Trump in order to prevent them from being published. Eight years later, Trump is once again eyeing his chances in the presidential race, but this time fighting criminal charges. And I'm very pleased to welcome Harvard Law Professor Ronald Sullivan, the director of the Criminal Justice Institute there as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I'd like to start with those opening statements, um, what they will tell us about what we can expect to see from this trial. What do you think they have done to set the stage here? Well, opening statements are designed to give the listener, in this case the jury, a roadmap as to what the evidence will show. Even more, these opening statements are intended to frame the evidence in a certain way such that the jury will view the evidence through the prism of whatever theory uh, each side articulates. So, for example, you heard the prosecution use pithy phrases like uh, pure and simple. Right. This case is about election interference, pure and simple. If the jury believes that, then they'll start understanding the evidence through that theory. On the other hand, the defense uh, tried to portray this case as a big nothing burger. In other words, this case, nothing in it is criminal at all. It's about, to the extent it's about election interference, that's what democracy is all about. Now, if the jury believes that, then they will understand all the evidence uh, through that, through, through the prism of that theory. Now, if I understand this correctly, the district attorney is using a novel legal theory uh, to turn what might normally be a misdemeanor into a felony by alleging that Trump falsified business records in order to cover up another crime uh, violating campaign finance laws. Could you tell us about this strategy and what you think its chances of success are? Well, it's a, a, a great question. So the theory itself is not novel. That is baked in the New York law. The What's normally a misdemeanor, a mis, misdemeanor can be elevated to a felony if it's in furtherance of some other crime. Uh, what's novel about it is this other crime is violation of state election laws. And what makes that novel is that Mr. Trump did not participate in an election in the state of New York as such. It was a federal election that he was part of. Uh, but the allegation is that he violated state components of this federal election. Uh, there's a secondary theory that will come out in evidence, and that's Mr. Trump violated tax laws as well. And that, too, would elevate the misdemeanor to a felony. What I think the defense is banking on is that the jury will kind of shrug its collective shoulders and say, is this really a case that the criminal law should deal with? Is the criminal law too blunt an instrument for what amounts to a record-keeping error? That's what the defense is hoping that the jury will conclude. 
And if convicted, Trump would then be sentenced uh, by, by the judge. What options would potentially be on the table if he is found guilty? Well, options on the table would be anything from a probationary sentence to prison time. It is highly, highly, highly unlikely that if he is convicted, he will be sentenced to prison. This is a class E felony in New York, which means that it is the lowest level of all felonies. Mr. Trump doesn't have a record. Uh, so he would be an ideal candidate for a non-custodial probationary term. So if he is convicted, I anticipate that the judge will sentence him to probation and Mr. Trump can go about his business. I want to ask you about Trump's comments we heard just there about this being a witch hunt. Um, what, what would you say to him if, if you could reply? Well, I think what the prosecution would say to him is that we live in a country where no person is above the law. Uh, this is not a witch hunt. This is the chief legal enforcement officer in the state enforcing the laws of the state. Uh, these laws are on the books. They're on the books for a reason. He violated them, and he has to be held uh, to account. Uh, that's what I think that the uh, district attorney, Alvin Bragg, would say to him. And just give us a little bit of context. Um, how big of a deal do you think this case is compared to the other three indictments Trump faces? Well, of the other three, this is probably the least consequential case. Uh, at some level, uh, it is about how a particular payment was classified on ledgers. Uh, the other cases have to do um, more directly with the U.S. democratic regime. Uh, they are much more weighty in terms of the issues at stake. So many are upset, maybe too strong a word, but m many are concerned that this happens to be the first case that uh, is tried because it seems to be the one that is least consequential. Uh, but, you know, the calendars worked out in the way they worked out, and, and here we are. But this case doesn't sort of touch and concern big matters of state in the way that some of the other cases do. Professor Sullivan, I want to thank you so much for your insights and time today. That is uh, Professor Ronald Sullivan from Harvard Law.